Hey, I'd love to welcome up Miss Sonia Sohn. Obviously, The Wire, then Baltimore Rising, you have a relationship with this community. And now you're telling a story that feels a bit more investigative. There is a lot of tension maybe with the story. Did you feel any sort of struggle or pushback to, to get the necessary parts of the story to tell this story? Was there any, any tension outside of who was allowed to be in the film and all that sort of stuff? Was it, was it difficult at all? <laughs> was it difficult? <laughs> All of those theories that were popping up and, and the, um, the constant pendulum swimming was really, you know, was really difficult. When you say tensions, are you, are you referring to tensions with the city and well, the really, establishment? As a filmmaker, mm -hmm. right, this is such a, a difficult story with a lot of different elements revolving around it. Yes. You're looking for people to talk to. Do people want to talk to you? Do people want to build this story? Or is it like people are reticent? Are they scared? Are they uncomfortable? Oh, right, right, right. Well, with Baltimore Rising, we had a lot more access. I mean, Kevin Davis, the former commissioner, is here, and he was a lot more welcoming, um, being a new uh, commissioner at the time. Um, and then after having gone through that phase in the uh, consent decree, um, was upon the Baltimore Police Department. They were not as they were not giving us access at the time, so there was a lot of reticence from the police department. That's one of the challenging aspects. Um, I think um, it took a lot to gain um, Nicole's trust. I just would like to recognize Nicole, um, who is here. Um, Nicole, please stand up. I, I mean, just I want to thank Nicole for allowing us, you know, access into her life and her family's life and the story. Um, allowing, you know, that story to be also used as a catalyst to tell um, a, a larger story that's, that's national to me, and that is what happens when we lose, what will happen when we lose trust in our police departments? Um, you know, what are those larger consequences? You know, this is a microcosm of what could possibly happen. You know, crimes go unsolved, not simply, you know, in our communities, and now it's, it's, um, it's blowing back, you know, in the department. Um, and I think then we end up with this sort of unsolved bit of a mishmash. Um, and that really doesn't get us anywhere, you know, um, leaving us with these questions. But, you know, for me, the tensions were, that we were dealing with, I think, as a production, you know, in addition to, you know, within the city, the city's actually changing right now and shifting. There are younger people who are coming into power. And so I think for me, knowing that, yet also knowing that this story needed to be told, and that was a part of the, you know, it straddled, like a Baltimore, which I'm hoping is coming into fruition, you know, and so for me, there was a tension going, how can I honor the city as it is now in its transition? In my love affair with Baltimore, I feel a part of the city. Um, you know, how can I honor that while also telling the truth of what this story, you know, had to, had to say? And then the final thing I'd, I'd say with regard to tensions was, we were editing this film um, during, um, not only during the pandemic, but during the, the uh, George Floyd, um, Ahmaud Arbor and Breonna Taylor, I mean, just that whole wave, you know, of killings. And, you know, we're American and we're diverse and we were having these debates and having to go back and forth and back and forth between and comb our own minds, you know, and those are courageous conversations that you have to have within a, within a crew. And, and I think, um, you know, we challenged each other to come up with something that, that was balanced. And, and with investigative documentary, I think it's really important to, to do that, you know, and, and, and you know, yeah, so that, the tensions, right, the tensions. <laughs> but now that the film is out now, are there any like talks in Baltimore? Have you been hearing things that people think about the film so far or any sort of private screenings or just what is the feeling about the film in Baltimore? Well, I mean, this, this is kind of like the big, I, we've had one other showing, um, but this is kind of like the big outing. You know, we're considering this the premiere, so I, we don't have the Baltimore re response just yet. <laughs> Oh, well, just that the film's being made or just the... the, the, the oh, yeah. yeah. But, you know, Baltimore in general is very discerning. They ride with me, but they're very discerning. So I feel, I feel both, you know, like, hey, sis, we got you. You know, I hear you doing that, that, that documentary. Yeah, what's up? What's up with that? <laughs> you know? Well, I don't want to continue on too much without 
hearing from the audience, so any hands? Yes. Yes. Okay, so thank you for the question. Um, so um, a former executive with HBO, Carrie Antholis, uh, who, what, he, uh, he was enamored by this story. It had captured his attention. Um, and so I, I, I consider him the first visionary of the project. And because of Baltimore Rising and my relationship to Baltimore, he came to me and, and uh, described you know, his passion for the story and asked me if I thought that there was, there was a story there. And after a discussion and uh, a development period, I came back to him and, and said, yeah, I did think that there was a story there. And we you know, spoke with, uh, you know, at that point, you know, the Nancy, the whole crew gets involved. And yeah, so that's how it, uh, how it occurred. But I would say that I wasn't, I didn't, I didn't jump on it right away. I was reticent to begin with. I just left the city, spending a lot of time with Baltimore Rising, which I was very passionate about. Um, and um, and you know, just I just think being you know a black person dealing with police issues and depending on your background, you know, um, it could be very triggery. And I wasn't I wasn't I didn't go running into this film going yeah, <laughs> you know. It, it took that development period, and honestly, it took meeting Nicole and her family because it's really I have to feel. That I can actually that I'm here for a reason, you know. There is some sort of um, wisdom or, or I don't know, some purpose that that I, I can serve by being a part of it. You know, I feel like I make a film with people, and you know, going into this, you know, investigative documentary is very different, right? It's like you have to have this neutrality, right? But I always want, for me, I think the. If, if I can say that there is a mark, you know, at this point in my documentary filmmaking career of a Sonia Song like documentary, it would be always to keep the heart and the soul of the people involved, like, you know, front and center, and that keep their, you know, that their truth has to be somehow, you know, the beating heart, you know. Um, and so that was, that was also challenging. But anyway, I answered a few questions there. <laughs> Sorry. Yes. Oh, okay. <laughs> so we'd love to invite some of our other special guests up here to the stage as well, if you're willing Do you to. want me to call them up? Yes, please. Uh, yeah, okay, I believe we're gonna have Dee Watkins and... Um, that's, that's, yes, please. D. Right, Mark Levin. <laughs> What's that? Oh, and Jeremy, <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Just come sit, just, just take a down. seat. Jeremy D. So let's resume this by looking back out there. We had one question, and now that we have a, a full house, including Mr. D. Watkins, well, I appreciate you being here, brother, on the stage. We, we're glad you're here to speak to the film. Are there any more questions? Well, there were a couple of, um, let me just keep it brief. I think one, one place sort of halfway through the film as we were realizing that the conclusion, this case wasn't going to be solved. I think that was early, for me, I think it was obvious pretty early on knowing Baltimore the way that I felt I knew it. Um, so we were starting to, at one point to lean into what killed Sean Suda as opposed to who killed Sean Suda um, and making sure that was, layered, that was layered in there. And again, the thing that I said about um, losing trust, it, it, you know, what led to the loss of trust in law enforcement and what could happen, what, you know, the dangers, you know, you know long term of um, that trust remaining unhealed. All right. Before I answer that question, I think the first thing that everyone needs to do right now is bow your head briefly because tomorrow is the four year anniversary. And I couldn't pick a more poignant day for this film to be premiered. And I want to thank Sonia and everyone else on this team, Nicole, for taking me in like family. And I'm praying for Sean every day. He was my friend. He was a client. More importantly, he was a loving father and husband. And we all need to remember that as we're discussing this. Uh, 
I was his lawyer. I am his lawyer. I'm the one that dealt with the federal government. They never thought that he was the, anything more than a witness against Wayne Jenkins. When you look at the pieces that Brian Kubler did, you saw the indictment in the film. You saw Ryan Gwynn's testimony. He was another police officer that says Sean was a patsy. It's in the documentary. Everything you look to in this case, the unfortunate reality of it is, it was like eating a whale for me because I needed the support of little people within the police department that knew what was going on was a fraud. People like Kevin Davis, good reporting like Brian and like Justin. But ultimately, it's people like me that had to get the truth out there. Those documents that showed why he was out there, he was ordered out there by his own sergeant, but you saw a government that was trying to say otherwise. You see people saying that he was taking money, but every single cop that pled guilty in the gun trace task force case, they all had evidence of the stolen money. There was none of that with Sean. You saw the FBI shrink very quickly and go away from somebody who was going to be a powerful state's witness against Wayne Jenkins. Everyone turned away from him except his family, people like me, some good reporters, and Sonia and her team. And that's why we were happy that HBO and Blowback Productions wanted to put that. But I don't have a doubt in my soul not a single one that Sean didn't take his own life. If there's DNA on his gun, I'll tell you stuff that's not in it. They found a freshly chewed piece of gum three feet from his body. No one knows that. There were other witnesses that they didn't want to interview. That guy, Dante Pauling, we had to make sure the police followed up with him. He was a witness against the TTF, the train to go, some of the most ugly hitmen in Baltimore City history. And the guy, he knew the name of the other guy that supposedly saw this go down and was involved. They didn't even want to investigate that lead. We had to force him. So yes, I'm a little emotional sitting up here and it is very hard for me to watch this film. I can't imagine how it is for you, Nicole. But I love you, I love my wife who came to support me. And I once again want to thank Sonia because without you, I'm not so sure we had a voice. And Dee, you may not have known Sean, but you said everything better than I could have said it. And I appreciate your kind words because you're a poet and an author, and I think Sean would have respected the way that you characterized him. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, I believe that Wayne Jenkins is capable of anything evil. Um, I think that's one of the most evil people that has ever existed. Um, I, I never, I always thought the suicide story was was bs and a cover up and i haven't talked to a person with sense a person with sense who would subscribe to that idea i also did i never talked to a, even the people without sense can't can't see that and i can only say that as a person um you know i i, <laughs> I got 30 plus hard years of, of dealing with these people. I was a bad guy way longer than I was a good guy. And um, and, and, and being there and, and being a part of that, um, you see things and you learn things and you know things. And um, I, I just don't think anything they're saying is, is true. Well, I'm not, I'm not gonna pretend that I have any of the knowledge of, of Jeremy or, or Dee. Um, I approached it when, when Sonia said it was going to be like a Rashomon, that it was going to be multiple perspectives. Uh, and even watching it now um, with all of you, for me, it was what Sonia said. It wasn't who, it was what. And what meaning almost like the Heisenberg theory of uncertainty. The deeper you drilled each new clue, the deeper you went into the rot, the more you saw a system, as Dee said, uh, that he and Herschel saw what everybody else was doing and did the same thing. And, and, and in the end, that thing, the war on drugs, the police state, the militarization of the police, the impoverishing of neighborhoods, any of those three theories would be a product of that system gone awry. Uh, and I really don't know, I don't pretend to know, but I feel the power of this film is at a moment where we're so inclined to say, 
the cops are bad, you know, Black Lives Matter is right, or Black Lives Matter are terrorists, and the cops are good, and you're just one side or the other. This shows such a more complicated picture of kind of what we're dealing with, what we've been left with. And I feel that's very valuable. At times, you are uh, emotionally connected to a lot of different conflicting feelings. And I feel that's really the power of this film, that in a way it bridges gaps. Here is a black man dead with a bullet in his head, but he happens to be a policeman. And as Dee says also at the beginning of the film, if that could happen to him and we don't know what would happen to so many others. So I feel that's where the power of this film and what makes the film unique at a time where we usually get just one side or the other. Uh, but I have to be honest, uh, I don't really know. Well, Sonia, we'd love to give you the... Well, I would just say, well, well, not that, well, necessarily, but just the final word on the film and what you would like to say about the film to let everyone know about the film before we go. Um, you know, you know, just, just, again, yeah, I think I've said everything. I think the two, the two points, you know, really for me, you know, I think we know by now the cop story, you know, what, what, what's sort of wrong with policing and law enforcement is, is you know, out there now. Um, and how we're addressing it, we're still figuring out. Um, what was scary to me was that we got down to this, you know, we've lost trust in the department and now the public is solving crimes and, you know, getting involved and now you've got the, you know, everyone, which is, could be a great thing, right? But it's also just creating, you know, a lack of well, I'm just going to leave it right there. That j j because I think it's a it's a much bigger conversation. I don't think the the film certainly doesn't answer. It poses a question, and I think that's the conversation I'd like you all to have, like leaving here. If you're you know, and I'd like to you know sort of hear. Um, I forgot to thank the composer, um, Lo, who traveled from Toronto, who's in here, I believe, as well as the one who did the, our fellow eggplant, uh, Sam from, from Toronto also, who did the graphics and the special effects. Um, they were amazing. The editor, Donna Marino, I need to thank her. And also Sarah Rodriguez, you know. Excuse me? Oh my God, and oh my God, Justin, Justin, please stand up. And Brian, please, 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 please. This film, the one thing that I can tell you about, about this kind of film um, that I knew right off the bat is I knew Baltimore. Um, I, I had access to a lot of the inside sort of, you know, community, you know, uh, of Baltimore, you know, and political structure to some degree. Jill, State Senator Jill Carter, where are you? Please stand up. Okay, these are all the people who dump information on me, okay, that you end up seeing in the film, even though you might not see them in the film a lot. Yeah, single-handedly, you know, turned the LEOPR out in, in, in Maryland. But, um, but I knew what I didn't know. I knew that I wasn't an investigative reporter, and I sought out the people in this town who I believe had that wisdom and that knowledge. Um, and so, and there you go, making the film with folks. Um, and, and I think that's something that I can let's leave with the, with the filmmakers. So thank you all for coming. I really appreciate your support. Thank you, Sonia, Dee, Jeffrey, Mark, everyone, the slow hustle. It's been a pleasure.